Episode 9. Chapter 4. The remainder of my school days were no more auspicious than the first. Indeed, they were an endless project that slowly evolved into a unit in which miles of construction paper and wax crayon were expended by the state of Alabama in its well-meaning but fruitless efforts to teach me group dynamics. What Jem called the Dewey Decimal System was school-wide by the end of my first year, so I had no chance to compare it with other teaching techniques. I could only look around me. Atticus and my uncle, who went to school at home, knew everything. At least what one didn't know the other did. Furthermore, I couldn't help noticing that my father had served for years in the state legislature, elected each time without opposition, innocent of the adjustments my teachers thought essential to the development of good citizenship. Jim, educated on a half-decimal, half-dunce-cap basis, seemed to function effectively alone or in a group. But Jim was a poor example. No tutorial system devised by man could have stopped him from getting it books. As for me... I knew nothing except what I gathered from Time magazine and reading everything I could lay my hands on at home. But as I inched sluggishly along the treadmill of the Maycomb County school system, I could not help receiving the impression that I was being cheated out of something. Out of what I knew not. Yet I did not believe that Twelve years of unrelieved boredom was exactly what the state had in mind for me. As the year passed, released from school 30 minutes before Jim, who had to stay until 3 o'clock, I ran by the Radley place as fast as I could, not stopping until I reached the safety of our front porch. One afternoon, as I raced by, something caught my eye and caught it in such a way that I took a deep breath, a long look around, and went back. Two live oaks stood at the edge of the Radley lot. Their roots reached out into the side road and made it bumpy. Something about one of the trees attracted my attention. Some tinfoil was sticking in a knot hole just above my eye level, winking at me in the afternoon sun. I stood on tiptoe, hastily looking around once more, reached into the hole and withdrew two pieces of chewing gum, minus their outer wrappers. My first impulse was to get it into my mouth as quickly as possible, but I remembered where I was. I ran home, and on our front porch I examined my loot. The gum looked fresh. I sniffed it, and it smelled all right. I licked it and waited for a while. When I did not die, I crammed it into my mouth. Wrigley's Double Mint. When Jem came home, he asked me where I got such a wad. I told him I found it. Don't eat things you find, Scout. This wasn't on the ground. It was in a tree. Jem growled. Well, it was, I said. It was sticking in that tree yonder, the one coming from school. Spit it out right now. I spat it out. The tank was fading anyway. I've been chewing it all afternoon and I ain't dead yet. Not even sick. Jem stamped his foot. Don't you know you're not supposed to even touch the trees over there? You'll get killed if you do. You touched the house once. That was different. Now you go gargle. Right now, you hear me? Ain't neither. It'll take the taste out of my mouth. You don't. I'll tell Calpurnia on you. Rather than risk a tangle with Calpurnia, I did as Jim told me. For some reason, my first year of school had wrought a great change in our relationship. Calpurnia's tyranny, unfairness, and meddling in my business had faded to gentle grumblings of general disapproval. On my part, I went to much trouble sometimes 
not to provoke her. Summer was on the way. Gemma and I awaited it with impatience. Summer was our best season. It was sleeping on the back screen porch in cots or trying to sleep in the treehouse. Summer was everything good to eat. It was a thousand colors in a parched landscape, but most of all, summer was dill. The authorities released us early the last days of school, and Jem and I walked home together. Reckon old Dill be coming home tomorrow, I said. Probably day after, said Jem. Mississippi turns them loose a day later. As we came to the live oaks at the Radley Place, I raised my finger to point for the hundredth time to the knot hole where I had found the chewing gum, trying to make Jem believe I had found it there, and found myself pointing at another piece of tinfoil. I see it, Scout. I see it. Jem looked around, reached up, and gingerly pocketed a tiny, shiny package. We ran home, and on the front porch we looked at a small box patchworked with bits of tinfoil collected from chewing gum wrappers. It was the kind of box wedding rings came in, purple velvet with a minute catch. Jem flicked open the tiny catch. Inside were two scrubbed and polished pennies, one on top of the other. Jem examined them. Indian heads, he said, 1906, and Scout, one of them's 1900. These are real old. 1900, I echoed. Say, hush a minute, I'm thinking. Jim, you reckon that's somebody's hiding place? Nah, don't anybody much but us pass by there unless it's some grown person's. Grown folks don't have hiding places. You reckon we ought to keep them, Jim? I don't know what we could do, Scout. Who'd we give them back to? I know for a fact don't anybody go by there. Cecil goes by the back street and all the way around by town to get home. Cecil Jacobs, who lived at the far end of our street next door to the post office, walked a total of one mile per school day to avoid the Radley place. And old Mrs. Henry Lafayette DeBose. Mrs. DeBose lived two doors up the street from us. Neighborhood opinion was unanimous that Mrs. DuBose was the meanest old woman who had ever lived. Jem wouldn't go by her place without Atticus beside him. What do you reckon we ought to do, Jem? Finders were keepers unless title was proven. Plucking an occasional camellia, getting a squirt of hot milk from Miss Maudie Atkinson's cow on a summer day, helping ourselves to someone's scuppernongs. These were part of our ethical culture, but money was different. Tell you what, said Jim, we'll keep them till school starts, then go around and ask everybody if they're theirs. There's some bus childs, maybe. He was too taken up with getting out of school today and forgot them. These are somebodies, I know that. See how they've been slicked up? They've been saved. Yeah, but why should somebody want to put away chewing gum like that? You know it doesn't last. I don't know, Scout, but these are important to somebody. How's that, Jim? Well, Indian heads. Well, they come from the Indians. They're real strong magic. They make you have good luck. Not like fried chicken when you're not looking for it, but things like long life and good health and passing six weeks tests. These are real valuable to somebody. I'm going to put them in my trunk. Before Jim went to his room, he looked for a long time at the Radley place. He seemed to be thinking again. 